All right, how are we going with time? We've got one minute. Mm -hmm. So we'll wait a little bit. We usually start a couple of minutes after, to be honest, because, you know. Yeah. Just yeah. remember to put my phone on mute. We don't want it ringing in the middle of the call. <laughs> and how long do you think you'll both be presenting for, just roughly? Uh, mine is probably only about 20 minutes, I guess. And mine would be roughly the same duration. Oh, that's good. So we've got lots of time for questions then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we usually find people speak for, I don't know, an hour, half an hour, 40 minutes sort of thing. Sounds good. Well, welcome to everybody that's joined us. And we'll just wait a few more minutes for um, other people to dial in. And then we'll get started. Mm -hmm. Good to see some familiar faces joining us today. It's always nice. Mm -hmm. And of course, welcome to people who haven't attended our seminars before. So just for those people, this is a seminar series that we've been running since 2020. Most of these seminars have actually taken place online. And uh, we record all of these talks and they're available on our website. And I might pop that in the chat as well so people can find that. Do you have a mailing list, Jenny, where people subscribe to be notified about the seminars? Well, that's a yes, we we do. <laughs> it's an excellent question. We do have a we have a number of mailing lists. <laughs> Toby's um, nodding vigorously. Of sort of curating them. Toby's um, nodding, nodding very slowly, uh, <laughs> as if to indicate it exists. Um, and we will be doing something with that as soon as we possibly can. <laughs> A lot of advertising through, um, like we advertise through Twitter and LinkedIn. So, you know, we find that different people often want to come to these talks because the topics are all very different. So this year we've had talks on, you know, return of patient results. Um, we've had talks on COVID-19 um, within health pathology, uh, biobank networking, if I just look at the list. Uh, what else have we had? We've had a talk talks about stem cell commons, uh, clinical trials. We had a recent talk about ISBA, the biomaking organisation. We had the ISBA president and the ISBA treasurer here. We had a talk about melanoma biomaking, um, Institute of Precision Medicine and Bioinformatics. And we recently had a talk about issues in health and governance. And in terms of that particular talk, we also had some good news this morning that the manuscript behind that talk has just been provisionally accepted, which is nice. Yeah, so I've just popped the um, the link in the chat where if people want to catch up on any of our class talks, you'll be able to, um, you can go there and, you know, we're in lockdown. There's only so much Netflix you can, that you can watch, surely. <laughs> All right, but we'll wait, maybe... Look, I think we might get started um, and just yet yeah, thanks everybody for joining us today. We're very excited about um, our seminar today where we have two excellent speakers from both of whom um, come from the Cheryl, which is the Centre for Health Record Linkage. It's based here in Sydney and the Cheryl is a very close partner of the statewide biobank. So we're very excited to have two speakers to talk Firstly, about the broader data linkage opportunities that the Cheryl provides and also about specific opportunities um, for clients of the statewide biobank here. So I will probably introduce both of the speakers together and then um, Elizabeth and, and Usha will give their talks and then we'll have time for questions at the end. So our first speaker is Dr Elizabeth Moore and Elizabeth is currently the acting director for the Cheryl and her substantive position was as manager of the client services unit. So Elizabeth is responsible for a team who provides advice and assistance to researchers about design, cost and feasibility of data linkage. And before uh, joining the Cheryl, Elizabeth had a long research career where she worked in government, in Justice Health and the Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research and also as an academic at the University of New South Wales. So she has 
a lot of experience in research design and data analysis. And our second speaker is Dr. Usha Salangame, who I'm sure many of you know as well. So Usha is Program Manager for Strategic Pro Projects at the Sherrill, and she coordinates the data linkage services for Biobank related projects. So Usha came to her role in the Sherrill after over 15 years of laboratory based wet research experience, often with biospecimens, um, followed by a PhD in cancer epidemiology. So Usha has also held positions in both the New South Wales and Commonwealth con Cancer Control um, Agencies, and she's been a recipient herself of Cheryl's data linkage services in the past. So she's now on the other side liaising with researchers um, who would like to incorporate data linkage into their biospecimen research. So we are really thrilled to have both of these speakers today. And so I'll introduce, uh, I think, Elizabeth, you're going to start by providing an overview to the Cheryl and the data linkage services, and then Usha will um, follow up with more detail about the Biolink service for clients of the statewide Biobank. Thanks so much to you both. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. So while I am loading my presentation, um, well, thank you for that introduction and for the opportunity to present today. Um, so, as Jenny mentioned, I'm Acting Director of the Cheryl, um, but my substantive role is Manager of Client Services, so I'm acting until January 2022. So, the Cheryl, I'm just going to give an overview of the Cheryl and what data linkage is, um, and then Usha is going to give you some more details about the Biobank project specifically. So, Cheryl was established in 2006, and we provide data linkage services for researchers, clinician, and government. So this is a very basic definition, but basically data linkage brings together information that relates to the same individual, the same family, the same place or the same event from different data sets. So in this way, it's possible to construct a sequence of health events for an individual and create what we sometimes refer to as a story about their life and about their health. So you might wonder why we bother to link data or why there's a data linkage unit. Um, so data about health and healthcare are fragmented. So the data that's collected about someone's healthcare from different sectors and systems comes under different legislation and different funding. So even at a very basic level, admitted patient data and emergency department data are not linked um, routinely um, outside of what the Cheryl does. Um, so it's difficult to get an overall picture of health service utilisation or outcomes without linking the data together. And then there's also non-health service providers that help hold relevant information or data about a person's life um, or the, the things that happen to them throughout their life. And so linking data helps to bring those non-health services um, and data together with health data. So linkage adds value to so diff, joining different data sets together, we can leverage detail and quality of information so that if one data set is missing a piece of information about somebody, we can add another data set. Oops, sorry, I don't know why that jumped ahead. I didn't touch anything. Um, it can add um, information about a person so we can bring different pieces of a person's puzzle together. Um, and linkage on whole populations, a lot of what we do is done without consent. There's a waiver of consent issued by an ethics committee, and that can um, help to minimise bias if you're looking at a whole population as opposed to a cohort study, which might only be able to recruit a small proportion of a population. We've also done studies in the past where someone will come to us with a cohort that they've collected, and we can actually add another cohort to that. So for example, somebody might be in a hospital setting and they might have a cohort of patients who have asthma and they might have been able to recruit really detailed information about a thousand asthma patients. And if they came to us for data linkage, we could provide um, information about those patients to them, but we could also create another cohort of patients who have been admitted to hospital with asthma who they would never have been able to contact and um, that would um, help to strengthen their, their research design. So this slide just gives an overview of what data linkage is and how we do it. And there's a, an animation of this on our website. So basically you start, hopefully you can see my cursor, but you start with a health record and that health record is split into two. 
and we have a data linkage unit who take care of the identifiers and we have a data integration unit who take care of the content data. So the Cheryl um, doesn't see the identifiers and the content data. It's never dealt with in the same space. So we try and we have a separation principle where we separate the identifiers from the content data. The identifiers go to the linkage team and via the linkage process, they're assigned a person number. That person number is provided to the data integration team. Um, we have this encryption process where the person number changes just as an added security process so that the data linkage team and the data integration team can't talk to each other about the same person number. We call it the wall. Um, and so the content data is then put together with the person number and released to researchers. Um, and each data set is released as a package with the person number attached. And the research team can then analyze the data by joining the person numbers together. Okay, so just in terms of types of data, um, there are many different types of data that can be linked. So at a very basic level, there's administrative data, things like hospital episodes, clinical data, which is collected by healthcare workers. There's patient generated data. So you might have, sorry, it keeps jumping ahead. Um, patient generated data, which could be patient reported outcome type data. Um, then there is patient generated data, which could be individually led rather than clinician led. So data that's recorded about individuals outside of a healthcare system. So in social media, for example, and then we also have machine generated type data. Some examples of administrative data, when I refer to administrative data, I'm talking about things like the electoral roll, um, births, deaths, marriages, disease registries like cancer, perinatal data, uh, what we call in organisational encounters like hospital separations. And then there's claims data such as MBS and PBS, which we don't currently link. It's linked at a, at a national level at the moment. So administrative data is collected by organisations for their own purpose under particular types of legislation, and it's not designed or collected for secondary research purposes. So while it does have some strengths, um, I'm also going to talk about the limitations of administrative data and why we find that researchers sometimes um, still like to, there's still value in having a cohort where you can collect really detailed information about them and then add the administrative data to that data. So the strengths of administrative data are that you can have a very large population. Um, it's not uncommon for us to provide linkage um, for millions of people at, at one time or even hundreds of thousands of people. Um, it's very longitudinal in structure. So the hospital data goes back to 2001 um, as an example. Um, and it differs from classic survey data. So there's less issues around non-response and attrition um, and it's available on a routine basis. So as an example, the hospital data is available um, three months behind the close of quarter and it's updated quarterly. Then I mentioned there are some limitations. So the level of quality control over the data is a limitation. So as I said, the data is not collected for research purposes. So there might be missing items and records. Um, and with hospital records in particular, records can get deleted um, for a subsequent um, update. And there are also lack of soft, what we call soft um, patient measures. So things looking at wellbeing. And the time list of the data, it can sometimes be a limitation. We don't find that so much with the hospital data because it's updated very frequently. Um, but there's other data sets like the cause of death unit record file, which needs quite a lot of coding and is, a, is often a few years behind time, as well as the cancer data, which they have to spend a lot of time coding. So it's often quite a few years out of date. And there's some information on our website about the types of data that we have and the data dictionaries that are available. I just wanted to point out also that there are some considerations that people should be aware of when trying to use linked administrative data. And these considerations are usually around the volume and complexity of the data, but also around the scope, coverage, quality and validity. So the data dictionaries will help you to 
understand um, the limitations of each individual data set. So as an example, the cancer data, there's two main collections that we use, the CCR, which is the, clinical, uh, the cancer registry, and then the ClinCR, which is a treatment data set. Now, um, this picture at the top with the arrow might be um, what somebody's intending to look at, um, follow a patient's journey, um, but they need to be aware that recurrence is not counted in the CCR, so they'd miss that incidence of recurrence um, as it's not captured in the data. And then the second example that I have down the bottom here, the cohort is persons having cancer treatment in New South Wales from 2004 to 2007. Um, and so you can see here when this treatment cohort is linked to CCR, the link rate, linkage rate is only 70%. You might get that data set back and think, wow, that's a really poor linkage rate. Um, but one thing you would need to take into account is the fact that someone who's having treatment in 2004 is likely to have been diagnosed earlier than 2004. So we can see that when we extend the time period for the linked data set back to 1994, we actually pick up nearly 20% more links. And you can see here still the linkage rate is not 100%. Um, and that could be because the person was diagnosed um, out of New South, outside of New South Wales, maybe in another state, or there could be a missed link, or they could have even been diagnosed prior to 1994. So Cheryl is part of the Population and Health Research Network, which is a Australian government initiative um, which brings together all the data linkage units around Australia. And um, as I mentioned before, Cheryl doesn't link Commonwealth data currently, and that's um, linked by an accredited integrating authority at the moment, that's the ABS and the AIHW. And so this um, page just shows you where the data linkage units are around Australia, and we work closely with those data linkage units if people want a cross-jurisdictional data linkage study. So um, you'll see there's NT doesn't have a dot, South Australia looks after NT and New South Wales looks after the ACT data as well. So we have what's called a master linkage key, which is a comprehensive system of routinely updated links and it contains person-based and family-based links. Um, and this is a, it's a more timely and cost-effective way of accessing data, but you're not restricted to the data sets that are in our master linkage key. I'll talk a little bit more about linking ad hoc data sets, but basically there's a collection of, I think it's 18 New South Wales data sets and 11 ACT data sets that make up the master linkage key. And there's currently 20, oh, sorry, 201 million records in that master linkage key. So we routinely link into that system um, and it's created under an ethics approval. Um, things like hospital, ED, deaths, cancer, notifiable conditions, births, perinatal data, mental health data, non-admitted patient data. There's screening data sets like breast screen, pap test, ambulance. There's also the 45 and up study included in that system, the Australian Early Development Index, and there's a data set that looks at um, controlled drugs data collection. So we routinely link these data sets and um, they're available, the links stay there and are updated routinely whether someone requests them or not. So it's an easy way of just pulling out links that are already been made. Um, so you're not having to wait for an ad hoc data set to be linked to other data sets but you still need an ethics approval and you still need um, a, a legal basis for accessing the data. So it's not, so it's quicker, but not um, immediate. So we link additional data sets to the master linkage key, but also to themselves. So over time, since 2006, I think we've probably linked over 150 additional external data sets. And this slide, I won't go through them, but this slide just gives you a flavor for some of the um, other data sets that we can link to the master linkage key. So for example, we do a quarterly linkage for Transport New South Wales, where we link their crash link data to hospital data. And we have been able to give them some really 
interesting information on what happens to people who are in serious injuries. So in, in, in the past, Transport New South Wales have only really been able to look at the death toll. They haven't been able to look at the cost to the government of serious injuries. So that linkage has been really helpful. Um, we've got we've linked some um, Department of Community and Justice data sets, and then also some New South Wales Health LHD owned data sets, um, and quite a lot of cohort research data sets. So linkage to administrative data sets is a really efficient way to follow up people who you've recruited. Um, and there's some, been some really interesting work where people recruited a cohort um, even 10 years ago and they've come back to us to find out if those people have died or had been admitted to hospital during that time to see what's happened to them. So we link data in two different ways, deterministic and probabilistic linkage. I'm um, just going to give you a really brief overview of what both entail, but deterministic linkage is basically where records link if they agree exactly on unique identifiers. So this would be great if we had data that was error free and we could do a lot more deterministic linkage, but because we're using administrative data, um, it's uncommon for the data to be error free, which is why we need to use probabilistic linkage. Um, often names are spelled incorrectly, dates of birth are swapped around, um, things like that. So probabilistic linkage is a process of linking records through the calculation of linkage likelihood or probability weights. So we have um, developed training data um, and we it's based on computer um, simulation type thing. So it, it presents a linkage weight whether a group of records are are a link or not. And then everything above a certain cuff cutoff is considered a link and everything below a certain cutoff is considered not a link and everything in the middle is clerically reviewed by humans. Um, so it takes quite a lot of computer power and then human processing time when you talk about a data set that has millions of records. So this probabilistic linkage process has been done previously for the master linkage key and those records sit there pre-linked and that's why I said it was easier for us to extract the data from the master linkage key than to link an external data set. So this is just a very brief overview about how you apply for linked data and this is on our website and I can um, talk more about it at another session if it's helpful. But um, basically, we are people, the first step is usually to plan the study, think about what it is that you want to do. You can contact the Cheryl. We have a client services team who are happy to have meetings and provide advice on the process, but also on research design. There's an application form. Um, and then usually most applications will be submitted to an ethics committee and that requires data custodian sign off, which we can help facilitate. Um, and then the last step is to notify us of your approval and we can start on the linkage. That's all I had today. Um, so I'll pass over to Usha and then I'll, I'm happy to take some questions at the end, but I'm also happy to um, have people contact me via email after the session if they have questions or if you run a research group where you would like me to come and present a bit more information about the Cheryl. Thanks Usha. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. And uh, I will now share my screen and hopefully you can see the presentation. I'll bring it up. Yeah, are we able to um, see the screen? Yes, thanks, Usha. Yes. Excellent. Um, so. Second. Yeah, so my presentation um, is about BioLink and it is about py powering biospecimen research through data linkage. Um, Elizabeth has just presented on what Cheryl is and what Cheryl does. And I will focus my talk on BioLink. This is a service which is intended to bring additional power and capabilities to biospecimen research through data linkage. Um, at the risk of repeating, and you might find that some of my talk overlaps with um, Elizabeth, Cheryl has been providing data linkage services for nearly 15 years. Um, as part of New South Wales Health, 
the biobank and Shero will work together to provide a secure and high quality data linkage service, linking biospecimen data to other data collections. Elizabeth has already explained the master linkage key. The Shero infrastructure holds over 270 million records. I got 270 million records. Maybe 70 million got added in these five minutes from 29 data sets in its master linkage key. The data sets include public and private hospital, ambulance, cancer register, emergency department, and mental health. This data is routinely updated and new data sets are regularly added. Besides the MLK data sets, the Sheryl is able to link biobank specimen collections to data sets outside of the master linkage key as well. For example, disease registries, screening data, and toxicology data. So what is BioLink? BioLink is about linking biospecimens to administrative data held by New South Wales Health. It is a service of the Chero. It is offered exclusively to clients of the New South Wales Health Statewide Biobank, and it provides researchers access to a vast array of population health and research data linked to biospecimens. The service aims to provide an efficient and cost-effective alternative to manual follow-up, and it increases greatly the scope of the research that can be carried out using biospecimens, which are enriched with this information. And the service is available to researchers who want to deposit or withdraw biospecimens from the biobank. My slides are moving okay, just confirming. Yes, we'll share. Everything's great. Thank you. Thank you. So wh what is BioLink? Now, record linkage brings together information that relates to the same individual, family, place or event from different data sources. BioLink is an additional layer of linkage and it links biospecimen derived data to this linked data to enhance biospecimen research. This infographic shows the different kinds of data that can be linked to biospecimen derived data. For example, a researcher examining a breast cancer tumor collection might find different types of mutations in a tumor promoting gene within the collection. Linking hospital cancer registry and death data of the biospecimen donors can help to test the hypothesis if certain types of mutations carry better prognosis than others. This is how BioLink can power biospecimen research. Uh, BioLink enables the biospecimens stored at the biobank to be longitudinally linked with this broad range of routinely collected health data. A patient or donor might provide a biospecimen which is stored at the biobank. Clinical data associated with the biospecimens or genotypic or phenotypic data that can be derived from these biospecimens. And then there is administrative data, which is held by New South Wales Health or other agencies. And this is where Cheryl comes in to link these two different types of data sets. And the linked data is then provided to researchers who hopefully do some impactful research with this. And that hopefully translates into improved patient care. So what does BioLink link? The BioLink holds, the BioBank holds many biospecimen collections um, and uh, which are managed through a single portal, the Laboratory Information Management System or the LINS. Each collection is made up of biospecimens from a number of participants or donors. The Cheryl holds several data collections or data sets and quite often there are multiple records belonging to the same person across and within these collections, although they can be persons with singleton records in unique data sets. A single person is identified through a single person number in the Shero across these data sets, and all records associated with this person number can be identified and extracted, and they can be then linked to the same individual's biospecimens in one or more biospecimen collections. And this is how the biospecimen is enriched with the administrative health and other types of data 
and can offer additional insights. and interpretations for the derived information. The BioLink service and the use of linked data is subject to checks and controls. The linkage process has to operate within a framework of participant privacy, data security, the use of cutting edge technology, and is a part partnership between the biospecimen donors, the collection custodians, the pathology laboratories, the biobank, the shareable, and the end use researchers, not to mention the data custodians. Needless to say, it is complex, expensive, and resource intensive, but it promises to bear dividends. So where are these dividends? The applications of linked data, there are multiple applications. I've just put a few examples here. The analysis of linked data for hypothesis-driven research and publications, which is the kind of classic example of linked data. But then there are other um, applications, health outcomes research, linking biospecimen derived data to health outcomes, drug design, drug mechanistic studies, post-therapeutic surveillance, there's pharmacoepidemiologic research, the linked data can be used to understand health service utilization in a cohort of biospecimen donors. It can be used to identify a cohort for establishing a collection, to identify a cohort for clinical trials recruitment, to link biospecimen derived genomic data with phenotyp phenotypic outcomes, longitudinal follow up of collection cohorts, and also sociodemographic correlates for specific disease states. What does the BioLink service include? BioLink includes establishing data linkage arrangements for collection custodians who deposit biospecimens with the biobank. We can provide ad advice on technical and governance aspects for establishing the linkage. For example, approvals from specific agencies. BioLink also includes enabling subsequent access to the linked data for researchers who withdraw biospecimens from the biobank. And along the way, we provide expert advice on ethics approval and data custodian approvals. The linked data can be a set of routinely collected health data, and it can also include data sets and variables beyond those that are routinely linked and commonly accessed. How does BioLink data linkage work? Um, Elizabeth's already explained earlier how the data sets are split into two files, one with the identify information and the other with the content information. The identifying information is used in data linkage, and then the linked da personal data is used to extract and integrate content information. In the case of biospecimens, the identifying information of the biospecimen donors is used in the data linkage process and the donor's health information in the administrative data sets is used in the data integration process. I'll explain now one more initiative of the Shero in relation to BioLink, and that is the Biospecimen Linked Standard Data Asset. This is a novel model of service delivery, which is currently under development. It's being developed to simplify access to New South Wales health data. It consists of a core minimum health data set of linked New South Wales health data collections for participants of strategic collections. And the idea is that they will be available off the shelf at no extra cost to eligible researchers. The cohort for this data asset will include biospecimen donors of the strategic collections who are funded through the Office of Health and Medical Research funded biospecimen collection grants. And the content data for the most commonly health access data sets will be linked periodically and updated to build a longitudinal, constantly um, updated current data set. The operating model for the blister, the model is for appropriately consented individuals. It is based on the base, it is created on the basis of informed consent. Their data will be held in the core linkage system and linked once. After the people who consent are linked into the core linkage system, 
their health information will be stored in a linked form, which is the Blista or the data asset. Where researchers request the free standard linked data asset, it will just be provided by subsetting the specific collections for which they have approval. Subject to approval, we can put together other non-standard linked health information as well, which might involve additional work and therefore additional costs. Recipients of the grants have specific costs covered and therefore the linkage is provided to them free of cost. A little bit more about the biospecimen collection grants that I alluded to. The Sherald supports linkage of biospecimens held under the biospecimen collection grant to the biobank. So far, the Office of Health and Medical Research has released two rounds of grants, and we expect that there will be a third round announced at some time soon. The grantees will be able to link their collection to a range of routinely collected New South Wales health data sets, as well as additional administrative data sets. Simultaneously, the grantees must agree to linking their collection and onboarding their participants onto the standard data asset. And they can then contact the show and apply for linked data when they have accrued sufficient samples and their collection is research ready. So if amongst the audience, if there are people with research ideas, plans or specific requirements pertaining to data linkage by itself or with biospecimen collections, please contact us at biolink shell at health new south wales .au. and a couple of other useful links here. One is for the Sherrill website with a separate page for biolink services. And to get an understanding of the type of routinely collected New South Wales health data and the data dictionaries, you can go to the website at the data sets page. So thank you. That's it from me. And I'm both myself and Elizabeth will be happy to take questions. Thank you both. That was very interesting. I really enjoyed that talk. Um, I learned a lot. And I guess, look, I think we're very happy for people to, if people would like to um, ask a question, you're welcome to just raise your hand and I can call on you. But look, I've got a question to start with. And I guess it's kind of around, um, you know, obviously the possibilities through data leakage are really impressive. And it's clear what I actually learned through your talk was that through this waiver of consent, we have the possibility of reducing bias in data sets, which I think is obviously very important so that we study everybody that we can. But I guess one of the things that I thought about was, you know, if people are looking at linking data to relatively small biospecimen, biospecimen collections, there is possibly the risk that people may find spurious associations between, you know, linked data and features of biospecimens that really are occurring by chance. You know, they're not actually, um, they don't reflect uh, any kind of mechanism that's operating in the real world. So I just wondered whether you counsel researchers about that possibility in terms of choosing which fields to analyse and that kind of thing. We tend to not offer, we tend to offer advice about research design, but we don't tend to offer too much advice about analysis. Um, the data custodian's role is to provide that advice because they've got an in-depth knowledge of each of the data collections. So we do also on our website have a list of validation studies that have been undertaken um, that are really helpful to look at in regards to some of the particular data sets. But yeah, each of the data sets have their own kind of pitfalls, I think, that probably people need to be aware of. But I think you're right, that definitely happens. But yeah, we tend to to leave that role up to the data custodian, given that we don't have an in-depth knowledge of each of the data sets. Yeah. Like the data custodian for the emergency department data will usually caution people against using ED data to look at diagnoses, just because of the way that diagnoses are coded in an emergency department compared to a, an admitted patient data collections so are they the kind of things that we can sometimes offer advice on if we know. Um, but yeah, the data custodian in their review will provide an in-depth assessment of that. 
And the Ethics Committee also will look at a statistical analysis plan and they may require people to have a power calculation before it's approved. Yeah. I guess it's a little bit like the concept of pre-registration of studies where people sort of say up front, we're looking for these, these associations, we hypothesise that these associations take place and placing more weight upon whether or not the study validates that as opposed to... Um, and, and people specifying sort of what sort of post hoc analysis they did. Like, I didn't think of this, but we had a look at this and, oh, my goodness, it was associated. But actually, yeah, maybe it's just by chance. Yeah, you do really need to be really clear about what it is that you're hoping to find in the data in your um, hypotheses and your research questions. Yeah, that's right. Look, I've got a couple of questions in the chat, so I might read those out. So from um, Amanda Rush, Amanda is saying hello to Usha, um, and also... <laughs> Asking about whether biobanks cohort studies that manually collect patient medical record level data, is the mechanisms for the PIs to be able to link this granular data with the linked data that Cheryl can produce? It, it really depends on the size of the um, data that the PIs have. Um, quite often, uh, researchers will come with their own data set which is what we call as an ad hoc data set. And usually ethics committees require that the person doing the analysis is separate to the person who has the identifying information, even for the ad hoc data set so that the privacy is maintained. But so the there's usually a study ID or some kind of a number to that particular spreadsheet or database. And then they can use this one. We can provide the linkage key for that data set as well. And then the researcher can join the ad hoc data set with the link data that we give. Uh, Amanda, does that answer your question? Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, thank you, Usha, that's great. It can be done, yes. Thank you, and we have a, we have a Practical question from uh, Jeffrey, who's thanking for the very informative talk and just asking for estimated turnaround times from application to receiving linked information, appreciating that this might depend on the data set being requested. This is our most popular question. This and how much does it cost? <laughs> 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 um, so it does depend on what you're requesting, but typically... I would tell people to allow at least six months from when they first come to the Cheryl if they're requesting something from the master linkage key. It can take even longer if you're using an ad hoc data set. So I would probably suggest 12 months if there's ad hoc data sets. So if I go through the various steps, so you apply to the Cheryl, Cheryl takes a few weeks to review your application. I've got a slide actually that I use at a data linkage course and I go through the number of weeks for each step and it just adds up really quickly. Um, the data custodians take at least three or four weeks to review it. The ethics committee meet monthly and if they don't approve it the first time, it goes back the next month. Um, then if it's not a master linkage key linkage, we'd have to request the data from the custodian and that can take however long it takes. Um, then we do the linkage, which can take three or four weeks, depending on the size of the data set. Um, and if our data integration unit holds the content data, then we can extract the content data relatively quickly. But if we don't hold the content data, then we have to go back to the custodian and ask them to release the content data to you. So that can, again, take however long it takes. So some custodians are better than others. And I guess I'm presuming in all those calculations that the study, the researcher has already got ethics approval for their own study. So you're assuming that they're ready to go, they just need the data linkage on top of it? Yeah, although you need an application that includes approval for data linkage. And at the moment, if you use, I didn't mention this actually, at the moment, if you're using New South Wales Health owned data sets, you have to apply to the Population and Health Services Research Ethics Committee rather than an LHD committee. So those rules may change, but at the moment, if you want New South Wales Health owned data, then you have to go to that particular committee. Um, and then if you want Commonwealth data, there's approvals that that level as well. So I would caution people against doing a data linkage study for a PhD unless you're at the very early stages. Yeah. But yeah. definitely not for a master's project. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Toby, I can see you have a question. Do you want to jump off mute? Yeah. Um, thanks, uh, both Usha and Elizabeth. Um, yep. 
great, great interesting talk and also laying bare a, a lot of the uh, kind of me mechanics of data linkage and and the like. My question's maybe an obvious one. And it's also one of those kind of how long is a piece of string questions, unfortunately. But given that, uh, and this kind of almost follows on from Jenny's question, given that there are certain section of the sections of the community that are quite uh, concerned when you mention that there is administrative data being held on them, that these are things that government actively holds and are going to be working with people outside government to create these kinds of associations uh, about them. And particularly if you're talking about studies that might involve association with family members and things like that. Do, I mean, I've had quick search about this. I've had discussions with people who are researching in, in First Nations population health and things like that. Do you have a sense of the, any kind of feedback from people who are doing consenting uh, for these kinds of projects with linked data that people do actually have a reservation about participating in those those projects where there is data linkage and providing biospecimens as opposed to those that don't actually have any linkage to uh, a, a resource like biolink uh, or is it is it too early in the game too hard to get this kind of information from researchers and participants. Just, just an interesting thought, you know, based on some of the feedback that I've had with um, some projects involving First Nations public health and so on and so forth. Do you want me to start, Usha? I don't, I don't know the answer specific to biobanks, but I know there have been some general population surveys about how people feel about data linkage, and I don't have the figures off the top of my head, but I definitely think there is some hesitation among the general population about governments holding this type of information. Um, I guess the only thing is about this administrative data is that it's, it's held with the like so when people go to hospital there's a privacy statement that tells people that the data is going to be held and people apply to use it via an ethics approval and they need to apply for a waiver to um, tell the privacy commissioner every time they grant a waiver of consent so they don't grant it easily you need to justify that there's no way for you to physically consent people it's not just I don't feel like consenting people you, you need to say the population is way too big I don't actually you don't actually have access to identifiers to consent people so for administrative data there's no way you could consent people so the waivers of consent are fairly easy to get based on that logic and also a proportion of the people are likely to have died or moved since um, they were recruited but so I think administrative data is much easier to justify. I think there's probably some hesitation among particular groups in the community in terms of general population um, cohort type studies. So I think one argument with the 45 and up study, I don't know if people have moved the 45 and up study, it's a very large population of people aged 45 and up recruited by, by the Sachs Institute. Um, I think it's 256,000 people. Um, there's arguments that that study is biased towards people who want to participate in research and it's probably correct. Um, and there's another study that's trying to recruit a million people called Join Us being run by the George Institute and I think they're going to have difficulties recruiting the most vulnerable people in the community that researchers are particularly interested in and I think that's probably just, um, just a, that's just probably a problem they're not going to be able to get over. Um, yeah, I don't know what the other answer is other than um, there are uh, potentials to recruit control groups that where you want, like so from the master linkage key, it's possible to select a control group. But again, there's limitations with that. You could argue that the master linkage key is biased towards sick individuals because people who haven't been to hospital or had a baby aren't included in that. So we have had studies trying to access the electoral role um, and obviously Medicare would be the um, gold standard for a control group. So I don't know if I've really answered your question, but I think it's a tricky one. I think you have, Elizabeth, you, you're right. Uh, I, I kind of agree with you. I just wanted to say that in addition, when it comes to biospecimen and linkage, if, if participants are agreeable to have their biospecimens donated towards research, 
I have a feeling that quite often the accompanying data will not be an issue because they've already made up their mind to participate in research. And perhaps the more he greater hesitation would be towards use of their materials, which they see as coming from their body. And if they've agreed to that, then the use of accompanying data shouldn't be an issue, more specifically in that instance. Mm. Thank, thank you both. Um, look, we've got two couple of questions in the chat, both from Mamta. Um, thank you for a great talk. I was wondering if you link to the National Death Index as well as, as for survival analyses. That's the first one. So I'll answer the first question and then Usha can answer the question about um, levels of data for biobanking. So the NDI is linked by the AIHW. So if your cohort is recruited from New South Wales data, we can send the identifiers after all the approvals are in place to the AIHW and then they can link to the NDI. So for example, if you wanted, if your participants were a group of people from the hospital data collection, then we would send the identifiers from the hospital data collection to AIHW and they'd link to the NDI. Yeah, um, following on from that, the question about granular level data for biobanking activity, example, TNM staging treatment, etc. Yes, it is possible to get data at that level of granularity. The whole um, idea of data linkage is to have unit record data. As long as that data is held in cancer registry or some other administrative data set and there are all the approvals, the biospecimen should be able to be linked to data at that unit record level. Uh, Mamta, does that answer your question? Sorry. Thank you, Usha. Yeah, it does. Thanks. Great. So we still have a couple more questions coming through. We have one from Kevin who is going to ask the other popular question about <laughs> how much the data linkage costs. I will straight about into how that up one. to date the data are. I think that you did mention that a little bit in your talk I think Elizabeth but I was also wondering whether the kind of the the up-to-date category is indicated at somewhere on the website whether you can see yeah I'll, that as well I've yeah but link, sorry put a link I've put a link there to our master linkage key but I'll just share my screen quickly while I'm avoiding the cost question um so this is what's in our master linkage key so you can see the hospital data is currently available till March 2021 private hospitals are more delayed um so we've got New South Wales on this side and it ACT on this side. So APDC, ED and deaths are all updated at the same time quarterly. Perinatal data is a little bit more behind. Cancer is a few years behind. Um, again, notifiable diseases. But most of the data sets are about a year behind except for hospital ED, deaths and ambulance. I forgot about which is also updated at the same time. And not admitted patient data is also in the mass linkage key. It's just not in this picture and it's updated quarterly. So APDC, ED, deaths, ambulance and non-admitted patient are all updated quarterly and they're available three months behind the close of quarter. Um, the cost question. Um, it depends on what you're linking. So if you have a really small cohort and you're linking to data sets within the master linkage key, it's probably a couple of thousand dollars, but we have projects where the costs go into the tens of thousands of dollars depending on the number. So it depends on the size of the cohort, the number of data sets, um, and whether they're MLK or ad hoc data sets, because all of those things make a difference. But if you're interested in costs and you're not sure whether you want to go ahead and apply, we can give you a rough um, quote um, if you contact us, if you want to see if it's worthwhile before you apply. I guess or if you need a, sorry, so I was going to say if you need a quote for a grant application, we can also do that and we can provide letters of support for grant applications if that's helpful. I guess just in terms of cost per, you know, unit record or something, it seems like it would be very inexpensive. I mean, really, if you think about the, the sheer numbers of records that are available versus the cost, you know, I mean, I think laboratory researchers often don't think twice about, well, they do, they, they might think twice, but, you know, they'll, they'll spend $600 on an antibody without really a lot of question, um, you know, so we're really talking about a few antibodies or something. Yeah, and in my, yeah. Previous, in my previous life, I would have, I think for my PhD, I spent a year with a team of people trying to recruit 1,500 people. And so um, 
for the cost of a five thousand dollars, for example, I would have easily taken that opportunity to <laughs> recruit those fifteen hundred people. So yeah, I think the I think it's very I think it's definitely cost effective, but the level of detail is probably something you miss rather than interviewing people, for example. Um, but yeah, I think it's cost effective. Look, we've got a if anybody's got any other questions, um, please, yeah, put up your hand or while we're waiting, I should I should note we've talked about linkage with the AIHW, so they also charge a fee, and there's an application process there, and also um, they require the use of Shore or Shrey, which are secure research environments, and so you would need to um, get costs on that if you were interested in Commonwealth data. But at the moment, New South Wales Health doesn't have any requirements for using a secure um, platform for accessing. Um, linked data unless you're accessing 45 and up data which also needs to be only analysed in Shore. so there's a significant cost involved in accessing Shore that needs to be factored into anybody's budget. Yes yes I think I was I was aware of the the need to access Shore for, for for example 45 and up and in terms of the I think you mentioned the joiner study Elizabeth the biobanks partnering with that study Okay. It is a very ambitious study, but I think it, it is always, yeah, it's always, a, I think they're doing a lot of work to recruit across the board and recruit representative populations, but it's it's always a challenge, isn't it? You know, I think yeah. in most most areas there's groups of people that are easy to study and groups of people that are hard and sometimes the people that are difficult to study that actually need the help most, you know, underserved yeah. communities, so... Look, I think if we don't have any other questions, I'd just like to thank you both for very, very interesting talks. Um, I can see that they're going to be accessed by many people in the future in addition to the people that joined us today. So thank you very much for your time as speakers and I'd like to thank everybody who attended and for some really interesting questions. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.